I'd like to uh, thank the organizers, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Dave, Holly, a lot of friends I have at uh, Children's Hospital uh, for organizing this wonderful conference. Um, you have a copy of my slide set in your handouts. What you don't have in your handout, though, is the notes that I put in to the slide set. Those of you who are familiar with PowerPoint know that there's a notes page format. So when my slides come out and are put online, I encourage you to download them and then go to the notes page format because I have notes under each slide. Um, so you don't need to take notes if you're so inclined to do so. Um, I think I advance it this way. So I've been charged with telling you about new pathways and therapies. Um, it all depends on your definition of new. I will talk about some things in progress that I talked about last year, but I will add, as Dave said, some new things, and I will skew my talk more towards them a little bit. Um, I, I'm going to center this around the three biochemical defects in Friedrich's ataxia, uh, some of, many of which Gio in, introduced to you, um, that guide most of the therapeutic development for FD, uh, FA. First is decreased expression of the frataxin gene. Second is mitochondrial iron accumulation. And the third is oxidative stress. Uh, these are related, uh, as Gio told you. Um, this is the same slide that Gio showed. Uh, and basically, again, I'm torn. I, can't, I don't have a point. I can't use the pointer on PowerPoint. It's too bad, because I could do both. So, so for this side, um, for a while. So, so here's this GAA repeat. GAA just stands for guanine, adenine, adenine. Those are nucleotide bases in, in DNA. And so there's just this sequence of GAAs, and it's in the non-coding part of the gene. So the coding part of the gene, the part of the gene that specifies the sequence that actually goes into the protein for taxin, is here and here. They're encoded in what are called exons. The GAA repeat is in something called an intron, a non-coding part, and that's actually very important because in a lot of genetic disorders, the defect is in the protein encoding part. In the case of Friedrich's ataxia, it's not. So if you could figure out a way to re-express the gene, you could make normal protein, which is why re-expressing the gene is an important avenue. So these GAAs in most um, disease alleles, I use that word as a geneticist, an allele, is a version of a gene, okay? So you inherit one allele from your father and one from your mother for most genes, and if you have an allele, a version that has this GAA expanded, that gene does not make as much frataxin. But the frataxin it makes is normal. It's just a very low level of frataxin. So why does this GAA repeat expansion lead to very low levels of frataxin? Well, a number of mechanisms have been proposed I think the leading one right now is that because of this expansion, the gene gets packaged up into what, are, what is called chromatin. And in my handout, I put in an appendix for those of you that need a, a, a primer on, on high school biology and genetics uh, and may need a little refresher course. Um, it's in there what chromatin is. Basically, it's a way of, of packaging and turning off genes that are not needed. So every cell in your body has all the genes to make everything, but a muscle cell turns off all the genes involved in skin, and the skin cell turns off all the genes involved in making muscle, right? So the way they do that is they, they package all the genes that they don't need and leave the genes that they do need unpackaged. So for some reason, this GAA repeat expansion leads to packaging of these gene, this gene as if the cell were saying, we don't need it, but of course it does, and the result is Friedrich ataxia. So, um, what does frataxin do? Uh, this is my simplified version of what Giovanni told you. Frataxin takes iron and it, makes, it helps to make these. Okay? So it's involved in the synthesis of these iron sulfur clusters. Um, and these serve as what are called prosthetic groups. They're, they're very tiny uh, compared to the size of a protein, but they're very important for many proteins um, to perform their functions. They act as like assistants for the proteins, and if you don't have them, then those proteins can't function. Now, the focus in Friedrich's ataxia research has been, rightly, I think, on the enzymes in the mitochondria involved in energy production, which all have these iron sulfur clusters, and in fact, the way that works is, this is my simplified version of the electron transport chain, um, basically the electrons uh, taken from the food that we eat 
go through these iron sulfur clusters and you get energy. That's a simplified version. Um, I want to emphasize here, though, that these iron sulfur clusters are also found in a lot of non-mitochondrial enzymes and mitochondrial enzymes that are not involved directly in energy production. Rather, they're involved in intermediary metabolism, so a metabolism of fats, metabolism of amino acids, a metabolism of sugar. I mean, the focus has been, I think, rightly on mitochondria, but I think recent data, which I'll allude to later in this talk, um, suggests that the iron sulfur clusters that are outside the mitochondria are also very important in contributing to the disorder. Um, so what, what happens in Friedrich's ataxia is much less for taxin gets made, which I illustrate here by using a smaller font. Um, and so you have a defect in the formation of iron sulfur clusters, okay? And a lot of people have spent a lot of time working on exactly how frataxin assists in the uh, construction of iron sulfur clusters because there may be therapeutic options related to that. Um, so what happens? Those electrons that normally go through the electron transport chain uh, don't as well. More of them spill out. Uh, as Gio said, there's always a certain level of oxidative stress in our bodies that's normal. It's when it exceeds a certain threshold that problems ensue. Um, so these excess electrons lead to oxidative stress. In addition, there's this secondary accumulation of iron in the mitochondria. And it turns out iron, um, when not handled carefully in the cell, can also contribute to oxidative stress. Uh, ox uh, iron is, is necessary for life, but it has to be handled very well. The analogy I often use is gasoline. Gasoline is very dangerous. Uh, you don't want it around, and yet we use it every day. We just keep it in containers. We keep it away from flames. Okay, so iron is necessary. It needs to be chelated. It needs to be grabbed onto in the cell so that it's not free to do these bad things. Okay, but this excess iron um, can cause problems. So those are sort of the, the pathways involved. Um, so let's start with the first one, which is decreased expression of the frataxin gene. Uh, as I said, there are these GAA repeat expansions that decrease expression. So the approach is, well, let's try and increase it. All right, and uh, one of the approaches is HDAC inhibitors. This is pioneered by Joel Gottesfeld, and Jim Rushi from Repligen will be talking about this at length this afternoon at 1 p.m. Uh, HDACs, histone deacetylases, actually are enzymes that favor the packaging of DNA by chromatin, as I showed on the other slide. So they, they favor turning genes off. So HDAC inhibitors are able to reverse that. Um, and Jim will go through that in detail, I'm sure, but HDAC inhibitors do, in fact, reverse, to some extent, the expression of frataxin. Um, what's the downside? So, so one of the things I want to emphasize in this talk is that every therapeutic initiative I'm going to talk about has pros and cons, and it's very difficult, and I'll repeat this maybe more than once, it's very difficult to pick the winners, okay? So if anyone gets up here and says, I have it, I'm sure, doubt them, okay? Because drug development is fraught with peril, it's very difficult, and you need to have many shots on goal, eggs in many baskets. There's many metaphors that Ron and I bat back and forth. Um, but it really pays to, to spread the wealth because you're really not sure what's going to work out. So what are the pros and cons of HDAC inhibitors? Well, HDAC inhibitors, there are no HDAC inhibitors that are specific to a single gene. Okay, So I think uh, Repligen is doing exactly what they should do, which is to try and find HDAC inhibitors that are as specific for the Friedreich's ataxia gene as possible and don't turn on a lot of other genes. That way they'll be less toxic. The question is, um, if, you, if you want to decrease the toxicity, you have to lower the dose, and then you might not get enough for taxin expression. But if you go too high and get enough for taxin expression, you may turn on other genes and get too much toxicity. This is a very common problem in all drug development, to find a, a, a space between that rock and the hard place, between enough to get a good effect, but not so much to get uh, a toxic effect, is there that window, that therapeutic window, that actually where the benefits outweigh the risks? Um, and that's where HDAC inhibitors are now. They're in clinical trials, and um, we'll see. I, I have my fingers crossed because I think it's a promising idea. Um, erythropoietin is the hormone in our body that increases red blood cells, keeps our red blood cell mass up to its right level, correct level in the blood, and it also increases for taxin. 
Here, the dilemma is how high can you go with erythropoietin and how much does it increase for taxin and how much does it increase for taxin in neurons and heart cells, which are the affected cells in the body. Um, Geo went through some models. The, the downside of, the upside of models is they're easier to work with, allow us to screen large numbers of drugs. The downside of models is all of them have aspects that are unrealistic and that we have to sort of adjust for. Um, one of the models we use actually is blood cells from humans, and it really is a model because blood cells are not affected in free attacks, they are they. So the question is, if you have something that's effective in a blood cell, is it going to be effective in a neuron? Um, and these are difficult questions to approach, but ones that we are confronting. So the downside of erythropoietin is, of course, that it leads to making too many red blood cells. So the question is, how much for taxin increase can you get at the price of increasing red blood cells too much? Because if you have too many red blood cells in your blood, it can stress your heart, and as you know, in free taxia, the heart is affected. So those are, the, those are the things to think about as you read about erythropoietin. And I, I, wanna, I should have mentioned earlier that on the FARA website, Friedrich Taxi Research Alliance website, curefa.org, I hope most of you are familiar with it. If you're not, definitely check it out. It's a fantastic website. There is a page that shows, has a paragraph on every drug that I'm going to talk about, except the two or three new ones. Um, so there's something in there about this as well. And so that's another source of information if I'm, I'm snowing you during this talk. Uh, for tax and replacement is an idea being pioneered by Mark Payne in Indiana. That's to actually use the protein as a drug. The problem with that is it's very difficult to deliver the protein to cells and sustain it. Um, so that presents some technological difficulties. I think they might be overcome. Um, and I think it's a promising approach to continue to try. Uh, high throughput screening basically says we don't know everything about these pathways, so let's let the cells tell us what works best. All right, so let's just take 300,000 compounds and screen them blindly, unbiased, and just say, okay, um, which ones make the cells feel better? Uh, in the case of Marek Naparella, he used high throughput screening to screen for drugs that increase for taxin expression and pulled out some interesting ones. Uh, in my own lab, um, I did two high throughput screens, one of 342,000 compounds using the yeast model that Gio mentioned. Uh, another screen, which definitely falls into the category of new, if not crazy, um, I screened um, a three million uh, clone library of, of micro RNAs. These are little tiny RNAs that actually are very important to regulate uh, cell functions, and we actually have a microRNA that increases for taxon expression. How it does that is of interest to some companies um, because as with for taxon replacement, delivering small RNAs is much more difficult than delivering a typical small drug. Um, RNA and neither RNA nor proteins cross into cells very well, so you have to package them in a way that can actually get them into cells. So for these little tiny RNAs that I have that seem to be quite effective in tissue culture, meaning cells in a dish, um, how you would deliver them in a human is, is an interesting technological question and one that's I'm obviously exploring. Um, new approaches. The, the new approaches I want to talk about today are centered on um, some findings uh, that have come out in the last couple of years um, concerning a protein called PGC1-alpha. Okay, so what is PGC1-alpha? It's involved, it, it's, a, it's called a transcriptional activator. So it's a, it's a protein that activates many, many genes. Um, those genes are involved in mitochondrial repair and renewal, uh, mitochondrial energy production, uh, expression of antioxidant enzymes, um, and for taxin expression. So this is a very, very important protein to have. Um, and normally, it responds to mitochondrial dysfunction, among other things. So, so PGC1-alpha is a protein that sort of integrates many signals in the cell and, and is part of the decision process for the cell to say, we need to fix our mitochondria, make more mitochondria. Um, and as I said, it usually responds to mitochondrial dysfunction. So you would guess, based on what I just told you, that PGC1-alpha would be highly activated in Frieder cetaxia because there is mitochondrial dysfunction. The interesting finding that came out um, from uh, Giovanni Coppola et al. is that it's decreased in Frieder cetaxia cells, which makes no sense at all because there is mitochondrial dysfunction in Frieder cells. So PGC1-alpha should be dramatically increased, and instead it's dramatically decreased. Why is this paradox important and what does it tell us? Well, <clears throat> here's my, my cartoon slide of the hypothetical vicious cycle. And this is all hypothetical. Um, the stress here is on new. 
uh, it may be disproved. So as I said, decrease for taxin leads to a decrease in the assembly of iron sulfur clusters and a consequent decrease in mitochondrial function. Because of this decrease in iron sulfur clusters, there's this imbalance of iron inside the cell, all right? Friedrich's ataxia, as, as Dave and I showed many years ago, it is not a disorder of, of total body iron overload. It's a, it's a disorder of uh, impaired intracellular iron equilibrium. There's more iron in the mitochondria, but there's actually decreased iron outside the mitochondria in the cytosol. The cytosol is the extra mitochondrial space. So we've been focused for many years on this increase of mitochondrial iron because of the damage that iron can do through oxidative stress, <clears throat> but there hasn't been a lot of focus on this decrease in cytosolic iron, and I think it may be quite important uh, in contributing to the disorder. So usually what happens is mitochondrial dysfunction uh, activates PGC1-alpha, which then feeds back and, among other things, increases for taxin. But this isn't happening in a Friedrich cell, as I said. But for some reason, this is decreased instead of increased, which makes no sense. So why is that? Well, there are a lot of hypotheses. I don't think there anybody knows, uh, unless uh, you know, and I, I, you haven't published it yet, I don't know, or Giovanni, um, but I haven't read anything that, that convinces me that anybody knows why this is, but there are hypotheses that are out there. Um, I, I was pointing to Gino Cordopassi, one of the leading researchers in this field. Uh, so one possibility proposed by Massimo Pandolfo uh, is that that low cytosolic iron I mentioned is somehow feeding back and blunting this response of uh, PGC1-alpha to mitochondrial dysfunction. In other words, with very low cytosolic iron, PGC1-alpha says, well, we have no iron around, doesn't think we have iron around, um, so there's no point in increasing mitochondrial function because there's not enough iron to support it, right? So there's this misregulation. Another possibility is, I mentioned earlier, that iron sulfur clusters are not just involved in mitochondrial iron production. They're involved in many other enzymes in intermediary metabolism fats, amino acids, and other things. And I suspect strongly that some of those metabolic impairments are feeding back on this pathway and thereby dampening, decreasing PGC1-alpha, which further decreases for taxins. So that's the vicious cycle. So why is this important? I've taken you through in, in cartoon form some highfalutin basic science. Um, and I think this illustrates how the more we understand these pathways, the more therapeutic possibilities suggest themselves, okay? So what if you had uh, something that could grab onto iron and move it from the mitochondria into the cytosol very gently? You could potentially decrease this inhibition and resurrect for taxin expression. So in the 342,000 compound high throughput drug screen I did, um, we pulled out something that I think does this. Uh, we have a compound that in fact looks like a weak iron chelator, and I say weak because strong iron chelators hold onto iron too strongly, and iron being necessary for life, you, you, have, you can't hold it onto, onto it too strongly or you actually screw up the cell. So it has to be something that only gently moves iron down its concentration gradient out to the cytosol. And these weak iron chelators that we found uh, increase PGC1-alpha and frataxin five-fold which is phenomenal. And in one of the most uh, frustrating episodes of my career, we have run into medicinal chemistry problems. So the medicinal chemists made uh, this compound for me, and some of their preps do these miraculous things, and other preps don't. And we have spent many, many months trying to figure out what the difference is between the tube that works and the tube that doesn't. And every spectroscopy and, and test that they do says they're the same. Um, but we have one uh, tube that for three years has been sitting in a drawer, and if we take one tiny little microliter of that and stick it in a dish, for taxin goes up, PGC1-alpha goes up, and it looks great, but we can't replicate it. So this illustrates the problem I talked, alluded to earlier, which is that drug development has many, many, many steps. If you can't reproducibly synthesize a drug, you don't have a drug, okay, that's gonna go all the way. So here's something that's very promising, but it hit this snag. And the, there are many, many hurdles that have to be uh, gotten over before you get a drug all the way into the clinics, and this is one of them. Um, we haven't given up, um, but it's, it's really, really been frustrating uh, to be blocked at this point. But again, it's 
Drug development is, I'm gonna repeat this again, is fraught with peril. That's why you need to have many, many things going in parallel because some of them will fail. And one of the reasons, I don't wanna to sound too pessimistic here, one of the reasons I'm actually very optimistic is because FARA has had the wisdom to fund programs in many, many different areas. And I, that's where my optimism comes from. The optimism comes from the fact that we have so many shots on goal that even though the failure rate is high, I think some of them will get through, okay? So the other possibility is this metabolic impairments. And recent uh, data in my lab suggests that there may be ways to bypass this. And I have some compounds that I've been working with that are at least doubling, if not tripling, PGC1-alpha and frataxin that may be druggable. And I'm in conversations now with pharma to figure out how to do that. Um, there are compounds that do wondrous things in cells in a dish, but they're not druggable, meaning that they cannot be synthesized in a way, or in a way that delivers sufficient concentrations into the blood or that maintains stability in the blood long enough to actually get to affected tissues. So that's really the question um, I'm trying to address now in my laboratory. But I think both of these uh, initiatives um, are new because they're focusing on this very interesting basic science finding, which is that PGC1-alpha, which should be up, is actually decreased. So it, it shows very nicely, I think, the way that basic science advances can inform therapeutic development. So the other biochemical defects I mentioned, mitochondrial iron accumulation. Um, I talked about this, I talked about this, and I talked about this. So what's the approach? The approach is, well, lipid-soluble chelators. A chelator is a compound that grabs onto something. So iron chelators grab onto iron. And because we want to move the iron out of the mitochondria, remember Geo said there are two membranes in the mitochondria. There's that outer membrane, that bag, and then there's that inner membrane with all the convolutions where the electron transport chain is and where energy protection occurs. The iron is all the way on the inside, so the iron has to cross two membranes, but the iron is a charged molecule, and the membrane is uncharged. It's what we call hydrophobic, so things that are charged generally don't move through the membrane easily. So if you have a chelator that grabs onto iron, but then is lipid soluble, meaning it can go across membranes, then you might have something, and the, the leading candidate here is, is deferoprone, um, which is being studied by Apapharma in Toronto. Um, and I mentioned that I have some compounds uh, of my own, that's the, the frustrating medicinal chemistry purgatory that we're in, um, that are also chelators. And deferoprone is a, is a good, weak chelator, just what you want, I think. The ones we have are even weaker. And I think um, even if we end up being frustrated in our efforts to move forward with the weak chelators that we're working on because of the medicinal chemistry problems, it points us in the right direction for a more rational design. In other words, if, if weaker chelators are better, I think we can go in now and, and actually pull compounds out that are, we are known weak chelators and test them or modify them. Finally, there's oxidative stress, uh, which I talked about and Geo talked about, so I won't redo that. So obviously antioxidants are a prominent, uh, prominent players in the Friedrich's Ataxia therapeutic initiatives to date, most of you have heard of idebenone. Uh, it's, a, it's a terrific antioxidant in cell culture. Um, in, in cells in a dish, it works really, really well. Um, in humans, uh, the effect, I think, is blunted because it's not absorbed that well and is also not super stable in the blood. Um, A0001 and EPI743, uh, which are being pioneered by Edison, are second generation idebenones, really, and they are absorbed better and they're more stable in the blood. The whole approach, so I told you there's pros and cons with every approach. What, what are the cons with antioxidants? I, th I think the major con with antioxidants is that we don't really know for sure how much oxidative stress contributes to the progression of Friedrich's ataxia. I'm, I'm among the scientists who thinks that it does contribute, um, but I don't think anyone knows how much. Uh, I'd love to find out, though, and one of the ways to find out is to test these drugs in, in humans. Um, they are potent antioxidants. They work in tissue culture, uh, in cells in a dish. Um, and I think the best way to find out how much anti uh, our oxidative stress contributes to the progression of the disorder is to test antioxidants in pa patients with Friedrich's ataxia, and that's what we're doing. Um, Pioglitazone is a very interesting drug. I, I listed under oxidative stress, but in fact, it is an activator of PGC1-alpha. 
and it is in clinical trials in France. Um, pioglitazone has the pros and cons. Uh, I'd say the, 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 the pros are, include the fact that it, it activates PGC1-alpha. One of the cons is that it's related, it's a cousin really of a drug called rosiglitazone. Uh, rosiglitazone carries now a black box warning from the FDA for heart problems. So, you know, the question is how much, not whether pioglitazone could be beneficial for free drugs taxi, but really how much can we, well, that is the question, but the, it, it's framed around more how much can we push the dose given that there are heart problems in free taxi to increase for taxin. So that's the rock and the hard place. You want to go higher to get more for taxin expression, but you don't want to go so high that you cause heart problems uh, insofar as pioglitazone has those. That's why our drug trial is in progress and, and we'll have the results, I'm not sure, maybe the end of this year? I think it's a two-year trial. EGP761 is uh, an antioxidant from ginkgo biloba. Uh, I don't know anything about it, um, but there's a paragraph on the uh, FARA website about it. Uh, I'm not sure where it is in clinical trials. I, I admit ignorance. Resveratrol is the famous anti-aging compound. Uh, it does increase for taxin a little bit. It's in, uh, being studied intensively in Australia. Interesting, re resveratrol, uh, does the opposite of what HDAC inhibitors do. Resveratrol activates HDACs instead of inhibiting them, which just shows you how complex these pathways are. It may be that turning off genes in one part of the genome helps genes come on in another part of the genome. So there's, there's, there's a lot of crosstalk between different genes. It's not as simple as you just turn things on or you just turn things off. These, these pathways are quite complex. Um, OX1 is an antioxidant uh, that uh, is being studied. Um, Hecht wizardry refers to a brilliant uh, medicinal chemist named Sid Hecht, who's working at Arizona State University right now, and he is trying to rationally design antioxidants that are just right for a free drug cytaxia cell. Um, and I wouldn't put, put it past him to succeed because he's really, really good. And uh, he has sent me some of his compounds, and in, again, in tissue culture, they look great. Uh, he's also aware of the problems of drug delivery, absorption, stability in the blood, because he is a medicinal chemist. And so I think uh, the nice thing about Sid's approach is that um, he's so knowledgeable about these things that he doesn't even bother sending me compounds that don't fulfill certain criteria uh, that makes them more druggable in the first place. Um, new approaches. <clears throat> My focus here, and I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about it, um, comes from a small company called Retrotope, and it's really, uh, it, it's, it's a unique approach, uh, and it's very interesting. You remember Gio, uh, in his talk, mentioned the importance of the inner mitochondrial membrane for energy production. The inner mitochondrial membrane is made up of lipids, and it turns out that lipids are particularly susceptible to oxidative stress. The reason is that oxidative stress often causes, in lipid membranes, a chain reaction, meaning that one molecule of oxidant, of reactive oxygen species, ROS, ROS, um, can damage one lipid, and that damage propagates through lipids through the membrane. So one molecule of ROS can damage two or 3,000 lipid molecules. The way it does that is by abstracting a hydrogen atom. So, so a free radical, as Gio mentioned, comes along, sees a lipid molecule, and pulls a hydrogen off of it, which damages that lipid molecule. In fact, it turns that lipid molecule into a free radical itself, which then turns around and grabs a hydrogen atom from the next lipid. And so you get this chain reaction of damage to lipids. What Retrotope has done is say, well, we, we, know, the we know that mechanism, so let's take those hydrogen atoms that are in the lipids and replace them, the ones that are really susceptible to being abstracted and, and damaged, um, let's take them and replace them with deuterium. Deuterium is basically heavy hydrogen. It's not radioactive. Um, it just weighs more. It has an extra neutron in the nucleus, but it has the same chemical properties as hydrogen. But because it's heavier, that slows down the rate of abstraction um, during free radical damage. And in effect, what Retrotrope is trying to do is reinforce the lipids that go into your membranes against oxidative stress, which is, we think, is elevated in free cytaxis cells beyond the normal threshold, beyond the normal, uh, crossing a threshold into, a, into a, a level that can cause damage. So 
they have these polyunsaturated fatty acids which are deuterated, meaning they have these key hydrogens replaced by deuterium, and these D-PUFAs, D deuterated polyunsaturated fatty acids, PUFA, that's how we are um, acronym for them, um, actually work extremely well in the tissue culture models that I have in my lab. So if you feed these cells the, the polyunsaturated fat, fatty acids that are deuterated at these key loci, um, they are very much protected against oxidative stress. Uh, and, the, and the neat thing about this approach is that because deuterium is not radioactive, uh, just, and it has normal chemical properties, generally, um, the FDA may look very favorably on it, uh, and, and we'll see. Uh, what I'm worried about, and I've talked with Retrotope extensively about this, is that the, the, the reason that the, the FDA doesn't mind deuterium is because it's chemically the same as hydrogen, but when you go to the FDA with these deep PUFAs, you have, they'll say, well, how do they work? And you'll say, well, they slow down the rate of abstraction, which is a chemical difference. So we'll, we'll see. It, it may be a question of semantics and, and how it's pitched, but it, it certainly looked very promising. And I can tell you in, in experiments that have been published in mice, these uh, deuterated polyunsaturated fatty acids, are, fatty acids are absorbed well and go into the, the cells that uh, need them. So uh, again, it, it really comes down to how much oxidative stress actually contributes to the progression of the disorder. If the answer is a lot, I think some of these approaches will be very effective. If the answer is a little, I think these approaches will be mildly effective. But another message is these approaches don't live in their own little universes, right? They could be combined. So I could imagine a combination therapy of a weak chelator, uh, an antioxidant, and a compound that increases for taxin, all used at doses, dose levels, that by themselves don't do very much, but at least keep, are below the level where they cause overt toxicities, but they synergize on their positive effects, and their toxic effects are distributed uh, among different proteins or organelles in the cell. So you sort of balance the toxic effects, but get synergy with the beneficial effects. Um, combination therapy is, is hard to advance because these companies that market these different compounds are very interested in making sure their compound is the winner. Um, and they rarely, if ever, sponsor trials of combination therapies. And I think one of the things that organizations like Farah can do is try and get everybody playing in the sandbox together. And that's not an easy task. And, and luckily, we have one of the great diplomats in, in all of rare disease history in Ron Bartek. So if anyone can pull it off, it's, it's Ron. So, so this is the uh, Friedrichs Taxi pipeline, which I, I will only mention very briefly. Um, this is an older version, I'm told. Uh, the new version is up on the FARA website. Um, I, I talked about most of the compounds on here. It, FARA website, again, is a great resource. They have a paragraph that which they update on every single one of these compounds, where they are. And what I want to point out is this, this y-axis here. Okay, so these are how far they're along. And you see there's research, there's preclinical, phase one, phase two, phase three. Um, and there's some stuff on the FARA website about what's meant by those. The, the little box here, preclinical, you know, is proportionally about the same as these other boxes. But actually, it's, it's a very big box, all right? So preclinical involves safety and toxicity testing in cell culture, uh, toxicity testing in animals, all this stuff. Um, and there are so many hurdles. Uh, it's, it's been called the, the, the desert of, uh, of drug development where a lot of uh, good-looking initiatives go to die. But I think we have several that are across that desert into clinical trials, and I think it's a tribute to, to Farah that we have this many compounds in what in drug development is really a, a very short time um, this far along. Uh, it's, it's actually most impressive. Um, obviously, I've, I've gotten to know many of you very well, and I know it's never going to be fast enough for you. Um, but I can tell you that uh, a lot of uh, very impressive people are working on this uh, very hard um, behind the scenes. This is an old slide. I was th thinking I should have updated it. On the other hand, if I update it completely, I'd have so many people to thank that I'd be up here for another half an hour. Uh, there are many, 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 many people working on your behalf behind the scenes. Um, if you see some, someone from Farah, uh, give them a hug. Kyle's here. Uh, he's, he's a hero of mine, uh, passionate, committed, just an amazing guy. Um, and, uh, you know, I, so, so it starts with, with Dave, I put at the top, 
Um, and he, he gets to retaliate this afternoon, I suppose. But, uh, you know, Dave, Dave, when I met him in the late 90s, uh, was a neurologist seeing patients. He was a very famous neurology researcher in a field called NMDA receptor research. And uh, my job, as I saw it, was to gently persuade him to, and I had to do this gradually, to, to come into Friedrich's ataxia, because I said, this, this is such a brilliant mind. Don't you want to be working on Friedrich's? And so I did it a little bit at a time. Now, now I've been subject to the same, uh, the same uh, <clears throat> gentle arm twisting by the second guy on that list. Ron Bartek called me up and said, um, oh, Rob, uh, would, you, would you chat a little bit about this Farah thing? Now, I, I can say it, it may go down as my, my greatest contribution to Friedrich's ataxia research was convincing Dave to work on Friedrich's. Uh, and the second might be to, to actually meet with Ron <clears throat> and get involved. Uh, so, so it was Ron that sort of pulled me out of the laboratory. And, and, and it, I, I, he made me realize immediately, and it, it made total sense, which is that, uh, that I'm not going to cure Friedrich's ataxia working in my laboratory. Okay, so it's, it's going to take a team effort. In, in Hillary Clinton's words, it's going to take a village. Um, there are a couple of other members of the village there. There are many, many others um, that you can read on this slide. So uh, I hope that if you see anyone from Farah, if you see Ron, you see Dave, others, Jennifer Farmer, Kyle, thank them because they're doing a lot of work on your behalf and I'll stop there. <laughs>